Welcome, welcome back to the first uh, full presentation of the news group meeting uh, for Vectric 2020. Um, so I, I'm Edward Powell, the Managing Director uh, of Vectric, and for the next um, 35 uh, minutes or so, I want to talk to you about the new features that arrived just in sort of June, July this year in the summer um, with our uh, free upgrade, right? So this upgrade was uh, available for all the product range. So uh, Cut2D, VCarve, and uh, Aspire in both the pro and desktop editions. So he had added new features everywhere. So let's uh, start by just considering exactly what is this 10.5 of which I speak? Well, uh, it is a little bit unusual in Vectric, but we like to give away quite a big release free of charge to 10 customers or indeed every major release. Uh, so we kind of have major releases every 18 months or so. And then in the middle, we, we tend to have a, a big release, which is is also quite feature rich. Uh, and uh, so the first thing to say is that in its simplest form, 10.5 is simply the latest version of 10. So if you have version 10 of any of our products, uh, Cut2D, VCarve, Aspire, etc., then you are entitled to 10.5 for free. OK, it is just the latest one in the in the 10 family of products uh, moving forward. Okay, but that said, it, it, and so it's free, right? It's free to all of you. You can just get it from the portal. Uh, that said, it's not just a maintenance release. So unlike a lot of software companies that release patches and point releases, which are just about tweaks or correcting things for the operating system or some new bit of hardware, this isn't a maintenance release. It actually does contain really major new features in all areas of the product. And so I think uh, it's definitely, you've got a really, really compelling reason not to, then the 10.5 release is definitely the way to go if you're a 10 customer. So let's have a look at some of those things very quickly. I'm going to make, this is going to be quite a slide light demo. So I'm going to whiz through the slides very quickly, but really we're going to get, I want to get onto actually showing you the features in action uh, in the software as quickly as possible. Well, let's just run through them first, just to set the scene. On the completely new stuff in the drawing side, uh, we're going to start by looking at templates. Okay, so templates are a completely new feature. They extend and actually add to some existing stuff as well, but uh, in principle, they're a brand new feature. We also have dynamic Bezier drawing uh, as well as a relatively new feature. It's kind of an extension, we'll mention it in a, again in a second, but it's uh, the ability to draw draw Beziers on the fly with your mouse uh, uh, is, is now much more straightforward. Uh, we've added two completely new toolpath strategies, really significant toolpath strategies as well, really useful. And those, uh, uh, at least one of those is in every product. So Cut2D gets the, uh, the thread milling, uh, and then VCarve and above also gets the thread, the thread milling, but also the chamfering, uh, which is a decorative 2.5D strategy as well. And then for Aspire at the top end, uh, we've added, uh, we've done the, really the first major uh, update to the core shape modeling tools for a couple of releases. So we went back to the, the very sort of uh, core shape creation stuff and we've added in two new shape profiles and also uh, the ability to blend between two shapes which uh, is really important and I'll show you a demo uh, in about half an hour's time where uh, I can really indicate to you the power of that that new shape and the new profiles in producing quite a lot of really really nice organic shapes without too much artistic skill and not too much uh, in the way of manual editing so it's a really powerful new feature although it's only a couple of buttons on the interface right so uh, as well as the new features, we've really gone back and looked again uh, at the at productivity. So we looked again uh, as a team, at everything from the drawing all the way through to, to getting toolpaths out at the end of the process and just looked at smoothing that flow. So uh, sometimes when you're hot on the heels of new features, you sometimes forget that there are a few glaring things that you've become a little bit blind to because we're just familiar with them. And it takes uh, you know some concentration and effort to go back and say, actually, do you know what? Now that I've had that for a couple of years, I can see that there's a better way of doing it. So uh, we've gone back and tried to do a few of those. Uh, so the Bezier drawing I mentioned, but uh, we've also integrated that directly into the polyline tool. So we've tried not to create a new Bezier drawing tool, although it is a new feature. What we've tried to do is add it to the productivity of line drawing generally. So when you're in the process of line drawing, you can now create Bezier's on the fly. I know this one's going to get a lot of demos uh, on the way from, from te uh, Todd and Beck uh, in drawing. So you'll see this one in action. Uh, drag snipping, again, it's a very simple change, but uh, up until recently when you, we've had these really brilliant little snippy tools, when you've got overlapping vectors and you want to just uh, thin out the bits that you uh, you actually want to remain from the intersecting shapes, then um, you can use uh, a pair of scissors to snip them away, but you have to click every time. 
and uh, that's quite good it's quite precise but occasionally when especially now with text uh, vector texturing and stuff like that you end up with a lot of segments that you want to trim away uh, so uh, this was one of mike's uh, first um, features so mike's one of the new developers i mentioned who's going to be doing a talk on friday so do have a look at that and if you have any questions about this feature this is one of his because when he first joined he said yeah i can make that a little bit smoother so he's just allowed you now to hold down the mouse button and sweep the scissors around and they will trim everything they intersect it's a small change but if you're doing those sort of things day in day out it makes a massive difference we've also uh, worked on our uh, offsetting the offsetting code is so important to us it's it underpins so much of what we do uh, and sharp corner offsetting uh, is, is a very tricky problem so uh, we're always working on improving that and this time around we've made some significant changes to try and improve uh, the sharp corner offsetting Hopefully, most of you never encounter uh, issues with the existing one, but I can tell you that there are a few uh, in very complex cases where we, we we still have a few cases where we can fail to get that, that offsetting correct. So we've addressed quite a few of those in this uh, significant improvement to that feature. Uh, on the modeling side, so again, this is in, um, in those products that support the modeling primarily Aspire. We've made some simplifications to how you work with two-sided models. There's a couple of examples of two-sided models. In fact, lots of examples of two-sided models over the next three days. In particular, um, Randy Johnson's talk about uh, making some wooden serving bowls. Um, when you're working with components in the two-sided world, you quite often just want to flip uh, one symmetrical or mirror image of your component over to the other side. So we've added a tool that does that very quickly off the right click. Um, and if any of you have seen uh, last year's uh, demos, when we released uh, version 10, one of the key things we added was the ability to have clipping boundaries on the, the uh, 3D models. And these are really powerful because they allow you to effectively pick and choose elements from an existing piece of the 3D model and use it in a new and novel way. Um, Quite simply, managing that clipping boundary is a lot more straightforward in 10.5. So uh, you can apply, remove, but also crucially update it. So as you stretch or move your model around or you're recompositing everything, uh, the clipping boundary can, can be brought into line with everything that you've changed dynamically and quickly with that uh, automated tool. So these are kind of really nice um, extensions to the to the design space. On the toolpath side, uh, we've made, uh, as well as obviously talking about completely new toolpath strategies, we've made quite a few really significant tweaks in the way that you both manage and output toolpaths. Um, the simpler ones uh, in pro profiling, uh, we've made a fairly simple change, but for those of you who do uh, cut slots, essentially, so if you're cutting uh, something which is the same width as the tool, it's a single line cut, you tend to be cutting on the vector, not uh, inside or outside because you're not cutting out a shape, you're just cutting a slot, then really the issues of climb and conventional milling uh, are uh, pretty much arbitrary, you know, so uh, which uh, is the side of the material where the tool engagement is significant on a slot? Well, it, it's equal and opposite, right? So um, what we've done there is is, is taken the fact that you, we don't care about the direction of cuts typically. So if you have all the settings set up where you're asking us to optimize those cuts and you're wanting us to um, simplify the or limit the air moves, minimize the air moves, then we can do that now really quickly. So if you're doing uh, grills or anything that's, that's a series of slot cuts, uh, you'll find that uh, multi-passes will be a lot faster and also the link and moves between um, arrays of those single lines uh, will be there as well. Obviously this, this is limited to the fact that you've asked us to optimize the toolpath. You can still control uh, normal toolpaths however you, you like. Um, there's a small but really nice improvement to the way we do the 2D previews of molding toolpaths to show the roughing pass uh, much more clearly in a, in a molding toolpath. Uh, a simple additional feature on the right click is cloud calculate all visible, not just calculate all toolpaths, but it allows you to calculate a subset of toolpaths by selecting the visibility. In a similar way, we've really extended grouping and I will show how groups uh, really work. Uh, in the little image here, uh, we can see the grouping system where I've grouped uh, some toolpaths together simply under the, the uh, type of tool that those toolpaths utilize. Uh, similarly, you, it allows you to select groups of tools and simulate those together. So you can calculate them together, simulate them together. So it's a the grouping your toolpaths together conceptually is another, it's a, uh, it's a difficult to describe feature, but it has a profound effect on how you can uh, manage, especially as you start to get more complicated sets of toolpaths, how you can manage them more effectively. That kind of leads us on to two other 
again, more advanced features, which grouping really helps with, and that is uh, importing templates and output, outputting your toolpaths uh, as cut files, both of which are really nicely improved uh, by grouping. Uh, we've also added the merging system. So those of you who've used merging to simplify and optimize toolpaths, once you create them, you'll find that you can now output those, uh, you can use those in a toolpath template uh, as well, which is really handy. Uh, toolpath templates, if you're not sure what I'm talking about there, again, Becky will cover those in more detail. Uh, I'll briefly mention them in a second if I try and remember in my what's new. Okay, so uh, the important thing I want to emphasize here as well is that all these fe these new features, I'm just going to whiz through them quite fast. I want to demonstrate them in situ and in the context of a real world job, but they are really nicely detailed in a series of videos on our YouTube channel already. Becky's done a wonderful job of breaking each one down and taking you through every step and every feature. Uh, elements. So if you want to get more information, then do obviously go back online and have a look at Beck's uh, What's New in 10.5 overview video, which is uh, going to go into each one in much more detail than I probably will today. Okay, so sort of a peripherally, but also a very important uh, improvement that came out with 10.5 is we added a, a module, a laser module. So the idea here, a little bit like uh, with rotary support on a lot of CNC machines, it's an optional but really a nice addition to a conventional CNC machine is to add a solid state laser. That's one that's using a laser diode as opposed to uh, these sort of CO2 tubes and mirrors. With a diode laser, you can mount it on the head. Uh, they're not as powerful, so they're generally used for marking and only very thin, limited material uh, cutting, but they get more and more powerful every week, it seems, that passes. So they are becoming a mainstay of quite a few people's uh, setups. And so we've added uh, some supporting tools so that you can combine, crucially, uh, uh, your normal routing with lasers. Um, but obviously, this is a bit of a niche. If you don't have a laser, it's not relevant to you. So we broke that feature set out into a module. It's purchasable independently of the product, but it is available alongside all the major products, Cut2D, VCarve, or Aspire. So you, you have the main product, you just got sort to of bolt in this module. Um, and it adds in essentially some new toolpath strategies uh, and uh, some laser uh, uh, tool definitions into the tool uh, database. I want to emphasize though, again, it is not for dedicated laser machines. It's not for running those sort of uh, ones you can buy off the, the internet these days from China, uh, which are using, like I say, they're using a CO2 tube. They tend to work directly off an SVG or a, a DXF image and they have proprietary software. Unfortunately for us, they don't really have open controller uh, access. And so we can't do much with those. Uh, what we're interested in always is making your CNC work best for you. And so we focused entirely on lasers for CNC here. OK, as, a, as an add on. But by doing so, I think you'll see we can do some exciting and interesting things that a, a dedicated later actually can't do. OK, so they are they're still complementary, in fact. Whoops. Go back to that. Well, uh, sorry. I was a little bit uh, quick with my mouse. So I, I do want to throw a little disclaimer about the laser module or at least uh, just highlight for you. Lasers, are uh, there's a so many different pr providers of these. We're going to have uh, a guest speaker from JTEC in the US who provides one set of kits. In this photograph, this uh, laser you can see here is uh, uh, an OP. In fact, I've got one kicking around. So uh, on the machine behind me, we, we, we have one mounted as well. It's an OPT laser from Poland, but there's lots and lots of kits out there. So we can't support everybody's kits because it's just a profusion of uh, of permutations of hardware. So especially if they're limited in their numbers or there's some inconsistency in how they're supported. So where we can make a single post processor for a set of commonly uh, found hardware mixes, we will. And we're trying to extend that list all the time. But for now, please, if you're interested in the laser module, do take a look at the uh, laser module section on our website. And that will detail the hardware list that we've actually properly tested. We've worked with closely with them, with the manufacturers of both the CNC and the controller and the laser module to, to, to make sure that everything works uh, as expected. We will try and extend it as we go along. You are free, of course, to have a go uh, yourself, but without you know, the comfort zone of, of Vectrix support, we really can't support the stuff where you're experimenting. But what we can do is provide you um, the laser module in the trial editions free of charge and the ability to cut some three sample files that we provide with that laser, the trial edition of the, the laser, uh, so that you can work on a post processor yourself. And there are some extensions to our post processor documentation, and there's also uh, some docs about laser. Um, migration of a post as well. So if you're confident or you're part of a group and this is something that interests you and you're happy to go without explicit support from, from Vectrix team at this point, 
um, then we have provided some supporting materials, but, but please be aware that uh, it's just limited what we can do here. We are always keen, if you get it all working and you're really happy and you think there's a value to other people, then by all means, get back in touch with us uh, and we'll see if we can't get it into the core stuff and get it core support. Okay, so that's the laser module. You'll see a few things about that uh, over the next three days. Right, that's enough slides, isn't it? That's boring. So let's get off the slides and let's fire up the software, which is generally much more interesting in my view. So I'm going to start with a blank here because I want to show you this new feature to start with, which we just mentioned at the beginning, which is file templates. OK, so uh, I'm going to just open that first one. Let's just crack straight on. It opens a file new dialog, uh, you know, an open file dialog like you're, you're used to. But you will notice, I think, that uh, the file suffix here is a CRV T and equivalently an Aspire CRV 3D T are template files. OK, and what that means is we're going to treat them slightly differently when you open them. Uh, in all other respects, they're really a normal CRV file. You can just uh, you can create your, your, your whole model, save it as a template, and it will have this special suffix. The key is this. When I select uh, this uh, template and open it, instead of opening the file from that location, what really happens is it opens the template as, as if, and creates it as if it's a new file. So it's, as the, at this point, unsaved. It offers us the job setup stuff down the side, so we can adjust a few things about the material block that we're going to cut this into, um, but obviously starting from the settings you originally saved. In this case, I'm happy with that. But let me just highlight again, up here, uh, you can see that uh, the software is reporting that this is a new, a new file. Okay, so it's kind of it's not going to stick with that location that that old file is. It won't overwrite the template. The template is a kind of, it just starts off, it creates a new, completely new model based on that template. Okay, and when we click save, uh, it will ask us to save this as if it's a new file, its so own file name, and it will leave the template, the original template will be left well alone. Okay, so what it's allowing you to do is reuse time and time and time and time again, the settings associated with a model. And that's uh, potentially very handy. So let's have a look at what I mean by that. Well, if you, this model we now have is as if it's a new model, but it's already got a stack of layers set up for me. They're colored, they're named consistently, uh, uh, and they serve a role in this generic house sign. So let's have a quick look at that. If I also uh, just page this up, tile my two views so you can see this general house sign. Over the side here, we've also got toolpaths pre-calculated, right? Again, you can include anything that's in a normal CRV file can be included in a template. So in this case, I've got these um, uh, toolpaths already created. Uh, I'm just going to look inside one. Let's just take a look inside this pocket toolpath, though. And I want to highlight for you down the bottom here that one of the crucial things about this is that we have set the vector selector on here. OK, so that we are automatically selecting vectors for this toolpath. If I open that up, you can see that we're associating with the toolpath here. Uh, and we are working on these selected layers. So it's, this toolpath will be applied to all closed vectors on the number, text, separator, inner border, and motif outline, OK? Regardless of what those shapes are. So anything that appears on those layers will get incorporated into this, this toolpath. So let's just uh, close that down for a second and recalculate everything. So I'll just do a quick recalculation. So it's working through the content of those associated layers for us. And then let's just simulate that as well so that you can see it will just simulate everything. So at the moment, you know, it's it's of marginal use to us because it's got a blank and a you know street name here type thing. OK, but you can see that we've got a relatively complicated output. So we've got a chamfered border. We've got V carving. We've got pocketing. Um, text content. These holes, uh, for some reason, we have to invent because I want to demo the feature. But for some reason, they have to be threaded OK, with an ML, an M8 standard thread internally. Um, so all that's happened because the toolpaths are associated with, with the um, artwork that's on named layers. OK, Becky's going to cover this in a lot more detail in the um, efficient machining talk. OK, so if you, if you find any of this bit confusing, just uh, watch that one and she's going to explain it. Uh, in, in great detail and probably a lot better than me, let's be honest. OK, but back to the main demo. Uh, what's crucial about having uh, your stuff on named layers rather than actually picking the geometry directly is that we can come in now and modify this geometry. So I'm just going to pick the, this text block, which is uh, you'll see it in an auto layout text uh, on the left. That means it's constrained to a fixed boundary. Uh, 
And that means that as I type a large number in, it resizes it directly uh, for me and keeps it constrained inside those bounding boxes. So I can change the uh, street name there, and I can also change this to be whatever um, the actual sign is, what the customer's actual address is for this particular sign design that they've selected. Um, we can even just take out the uh, the clip art here. The clip art's also layered uh, and it's come in uh, on layers. I've taken some of Becky's clip art that she, she'll provide for you and reused it for this demo. Um, my version is, is on layers and there's a couple of extra versions of that for you to see if you buy the pack associated with the, with the use group meeting this year. But let's just uh, get rid of Lucky Horseshoe and drop in something more appropriate for field gate lane. So I'm going to drop in a paw print, which comes in for us like that. Uh, just resize this till I'm pleased with the general shape of it. Something like that. Okay, so what I've done here, I've opened a template which brought me in the design. I've just modified the key placeholder elements of those designs, which if you recall, are all on pre-created layers. The content of those layers are what the toolpath calculation is going to look for. It doesn't care about the actual shape. It just cares about what's on the layers. And that means if I close down this and recalculate all, it now picks up the new artwork on those layers, recalculates the toolpaths for me. And uh, if we just simulate all of that, we can, oops. Of course, what we want to do is reset the preview and simulate all of that. I've got myself in a pickle now, start again. So if I reset the preview, now you can see that it's brought up all those strategies uh, for uh, with the new shapes associated with them and virtually no effort on my part uh, to make that happen. So that's the sort of power of a template. Beck's going to cover those in a lot more detail. Uh, meanwhile, I'm going to show you another little feature here. So uh, what I want to do now, this has got quite a hard edge on it on this cutout border here. So I'm just going to just want to fill it that or just put a chamfer, you know, a, a curved chamfer around the edge of it. So uh, most of you be aware already that our rectangle tool offers that radius, external, internal corners. If I switch that on now, though, um, I don't know what the radius is in real units. I don't really care. It's a decorative corner. So I don't I don't know whether it's 12 mil, 5 mil, whatever. Um, you'll notice it in 10.5. You've got a new handle appeared here uh, in the 2D view when you select radius corners. And we can drag that now around dynamically to adjust. It. Uh, the form will adjust with whatever size is getting set there. If I drag it the other way, it'll swap to uh, radius internal corners and allow you to drag the other way as well. So this is just allowing you to dynamically adjust something so that actually you can just do it by eye. It's for something that you want to get right roughly by eye. You can always come back and tweak the value as you want to as well. Okay, so that's just dynamic. It's a little change. It, like I said, these are ones where there's just workflow improvements that, that, that reduce your mouse miles and, uh, and help the flow of design. So again, when we, if we close that down, because it's on a layer, if I recalculate that now, we'll see that it recalculates with the um, uh, with the new boundary. However, it's complaining to me about tabs. Why is that? Well, because I've changed that boundary, the previous tabs that were holding the material in place are, are now uh, potentially not no good because I've changed the actual geometry. So it's, it's flagged that for me. And if I go to the cutout tool here where the tabs are, this gives me an opportunity to show you another new feature in 10.5, just again, a sort of productivity improvement, uh, which is that we can simply, we can still set our tabs automatically, but we can ask it to uh, avoid placing them on corners or curved regions. This is really useful because uh, when you come to cut those tabs out <coughs> and sand them away on the finished job, that's really easy on a, on a straight cut, but it's a pain if, you, if it ends up on a curve. So, because um, then you have to sand to the exact curvature that you've just cut out. So it's a simple change, switch that on and it won't ever put them on curves. Let's just do that and see. So here we've created our tabs. You can see the little T markers. Remember, you can always drag these around, but crucially, automatically creating them as avoided my radius corners, corners. So everything is on a straight edge and therefore easy to clean up. Okay, so that sort of brings me over now to have a look at the toolpath strategies as a whole. Let's just recalculate and simulate that again. Now that we fixed the tab problem and that will help us to uh, view the finished job. You'll see that I've done a cheeky little extra cutout no tabs at the bottom here 
uh, that's just to allow me to throw away the waste material in the simulation. Uh, obviously, I wouldn't output that one for real. It's just a, a handy thing for demos. Uh, OK, so the, uh, here's, the, here's the finished part. Let's have a look at this pocketing firstly. So the pocketing takes away the, the main area between these um, elements. It's just creating effectively a little bit of clearance down through the material. Crucially here, this introduces another new and really significant new feature in 10.5, which is the ability to stack tools up. OK, so you can stack up tools of, of changing size and scale. And what we're going to do is efficiently use them. So we'll start with the largest tool and we will work down to the smallest tool, only machining what we missed previously. Now, this feature has been available in the clearing of V carving and now it's added to uh, pocketing as well. So it's a much, much more efficient way to, to clear material and also reduce tool wear and tear. So using the bigger tools for the bigger area clearance. Um, it's really as simple as that. You can just add the tools into this list, click calculate, and it'll sort them out uh, and only do what's previously missed. So here you can see we've got the, the big half inch tool coming in and the second tool, the smaller uh, uh, tool, I think it's the fact it's a quarter and an eighth, is it? Uh, this is only picking up those areas missed by the first tool. So much more efficient and much lower uh, risk of tool breakage and tool wear and tear. Uh, the next big uh, thing that we've got here is uh, chamfering. So uh, chamfering in, in, in many ways is quite a simple idea, which is that we just want to take off around the edge of this material here. We just want to take off the sharp edge, okay, with a V-bit tool. Uh, now to do that in your head, you've got to do some maths. You've got to work out what your V-bit tool angle is and therefore how far off to move it. If you want to actually make the chamfer bigger than the angle of the tool, that's going to be slightly awkward because you want two passes now. All these things have been simplified by creating this new uh, chamfer tool uh, strategy available in uh, 10. This is not in Cut2D, but it is in VCarve and Aspire because it's a decorative tool path strategy. Uh, if we have a look in here, we can see that we can just set, as you would expect, uh, the usual tool geometry. Some of this uh, chamfer dimensions is pulled directly in. Once you select your tool geometry, we'll find what the, that tool is going to give you as a natural single pass chamfer anyway. So in my case, I've picked a 90 degree uh, V-bit and it's found that uh, that, that will, uh, for um, uh, generally, it's going to give me a chamfer for this width, which will be the same depth, basically, it's 90 degree. So it's kind of found all those values for me. I can tweak them and I could make it uh, extend that chamfer out. Uh, but in this case, it's kind of efficient single pass. Uh, as you can see, I've selected the outer boundary here uh, and I've asked it to chamfer inside that outer boundary and I'm expecting it to slope upwards away from the boundary which is uh, exactly as you'd expect so hopefully this is quite an intuitive way of describing a chamfer it's either inside or outside of your target geometry and it's either sloping up or down from that position so those are your permutations calculate it again and uh, that reduces that chamfer effect for us uh, really straightforwardly so it's just a single pass in this case of the v-bit tool but exactly offset uh, so that when we come and we finish off with our cutout pass, uh, we're left with the neat chamfer that the V-bit's left uh, perfectly uh, correctly distanced off the edge to, to produce the effect we're after. So it just simplifies things a lot there. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is uh, the threading. So this is a major, again, a major new feature for those of you who are involved in anything where you need to fit standard uh, hardware to your uh, finished product and you're cutting in materials like uh, acrylics or even metals where you need to have threaded holes then this uh, is absolutely uh, uh, invaluable but it's also usable uh, for those of you doing decorative woodworking and things like that because you can use this to make large non-standard uh, wooden bolts and holes and things and so hopefully many of you have seen uh, Todd's demo of an adjustable desk lamp made entirely of wood using custom wooden uh, bolts uh, and threaded slots in the uh, desk lamp so that you can adjust an, uh, uh, the friction nuts at the various parts of the angle poise of the lamp. Uh, so again, brand new in 10.5, uh, hopefully, oops, wrong one to click, uh, hopefully quite uh, straightforward uh, to understand. Uh, I've selected uh, a tool here that's uh, uh, an M5 to M10 thread. So for those of you not quite sure what one of these looks like, 
this is an example of a threading tool. This one's from our um, friends and uh, OEM partners in Germany called Soratec, and they provide a set of these tools that range across the standard metric thread sizes. So it's a single tooth that we will spiral down into the hole according to the pitch defined by uh, the toolpath strategy. And this tool uh, will allow us to get anything from an M10 to an M16, is it, I think, uh, type uh, threaded hole in the metric standard. Uh, in my case, I've got one of their smaller ones, which allows me to do an M5 to M10 uh, range of holes. And uh, I've chosen the pre pre the, uh, to use the presets of M8. If you're working with Imperial uh, units or in the US, then we've got the equivalent stuff set up for the US standards as well. You can set those. Much of this is, is found for you automatically looking at the tool geometry and looking at your selected pitch, but you can fiddle with some of those things. Crucially, the hole that you need to drill usually to ease the tool into is going to be smaller than the boundary. So a couple of one, two points to make here. I've selected uh, eight mil diameter holes as my target uh, artwork in the 2D view here. But actually, just like drilling, we're only interested in the center point. So I've made them eight mil because that's likely to be what you'll get from a DXF drawing or something where somebody's laid out the design for you. Um, but in fact, for the threading point of view, you can use any shape. We're only interested in the center point and any diameter circle, we're only gonna get the center point. What creates that toolpath is the settings here. So uh, in this case, this is going to be eight mil diameter regardless of the circle size that I select. Okay, it's just gonna be centered on that center circle. And um, the other crucial thing to point out is that the circle you need to drill is going to be smaller than that because it's got to allow for the thread to be cut out into the wall of the hole. Uh, and so that's quite difficult to find the actual size of hole you need to drill because potentially it's a, it's a sort of mathematical permutation of your tool geometry, your pitch, etc. Right. So um, what we've done here is just just create a little simple button that you can click once you've set your threading up click that button and that will give you the inner circles inside of the pitch that you actually need to drill and so that's what I've done in this uh, example as well so if you have a look in here I've got a clear threading hole strategy down the side that's using circles in the 2d view that were created from the threading tool directly so that we clear the area needed then the threading tool comes back in and, and cuts the thread into the remaining wall uh, to take it out to an M8 standard 8 mil diameter threaded hole. OK, good. Hopefully that's all made sense. And again, this will all be covered, I'm sure, uh, in more detail at, at various points. And there's a video in absolute depth on this uh, on our website as well. I'm just highlighting it for you. OK, so grouping and toolpath groups. The uh, key here really is that we've allowed you to, to start to manage conceptually your tools in a much more sort of easy to, to do way. So um, what you can do, you, how you, why you want to group them could be for any reason. You might want to group things related to the same material type in a design that's going to involve multiple materials. You might want to group tools in your head according to the tool geometry. So you know how many tool changes this, this job's going to require in advance as you're designing it and try and minimize those things. Crucially, though, you can create your groups now on the fly. So you can just create an empty group and drag tools into it. OK, so I can create a group here, which I can call my clearance group or cutout, say. And I've got my cutout, my fake cutout and my real cutouts. And I can simply select these uh, and just drag them into this group. OK, and then from this point on, it allows me to oops, behave, uh, use this these two tools together so they can be selected and viewed together and they could be output together and stuff. So grouping is really handy. Um, another thing that's really handy, like I said, if you want to group things by the tool geometry. So here, for example, I know that we are using the same VBit tool for the carving. So what I can do is just unselect that for a second, right click that carving tool and say, show all with the same tool. So that's gonna find all the tool paths that are using exactly the same tool, which in this case, we can chamfer and V carve with the same tool. And now, of course, I can actually create a group from those visible Component. So it's just a sort of shortcut that simplifies the process of getting your groups together with complex patterns of tool geometry. Groups are really useful now uh, for outputting stuff as well. So I will, uh, like I say, direct you to go and have a look at toolpath grouping uh, in more detail on our videos online. Uh, they are supported in templates, so if you could take them out in a template and bring them back in. Uh, I have probably going to be a bit short of time, but um, Again, with this, I could bring back in my, my set of tools with the grouping directly off a toolpath template in 
Um, one other bit to highlight when you come to save a toolpath uh, is that idea of, of saving uh, toolpaths where we've grouped them according to like tool. That's also a kind of automated process up here, uh, which, you can, which you can select so that we group our toolpaths only when appropriate. So it'll only work if the, those toolpaths are not separated deliberately uh, for some other reason. But if they've got common tool geometry and they've not been actively separated by you in the, in the design process, then we will actually save out the minimum number of separate toolpaths so that you have uh, one output file for each tool geometry type. In other words, we kind of say we're going to minimize the number of manual tool changes that you have to do. Uh, it's a really useful one. Uh, that and again it's just a workflow thing that just speeds and simplifies the whole process okay so that's hopefully that's a whistle stop tour we've covered a lot of stuff there and like i said 10.5 is full of new things um, from brand new completely new novel features to these little workflow improvements that smooth your life and remove the little everyday uh, pains and mouse miles uh, to get the results that you commonly need for the next demo, I want to just focus on uh, modeling. And that means I've got to move across to Aspire. So this next demo is Aspire specific. And I'm gonna start by showing you the, the output that we're aiming for and, and where we start from. So I've got a, a 2D black and white photograph. This is an image I took. I wanted to prove the point that this will work with an image that's taken uh, manually. So I took this picture of my daughter uh, a couple of days ago, just with my mobile phone. Crucially though, I have made sure of two really crucial things. I've made sure that I took the photograph with her perfectly in profile uh, against a very plain background. And I try to get minimum, minimum, minimum shadows or at least very even shadows. So what you want is very diffuse lighting. So if any of you are into your uh, home photography, then you need to have some form of light, light diffuser, ideally, or in my case, a photographer uh, ne near to a very plain white wall with lots of natural sunlight. The point is not to get any sharp shadows uh, from directional light onto the face. If you can do that, so you can construct this photograph, I'm going to show you a technique that allows you to get from that to a 3D model, which is really not bad, um, in a set of absolutely repeatable steps and crucially, no artistic skill whatsoever, which is very important to people like me. OK, so let's start afresh. Now, to do this, I want to uh, allow you all to use uh, a common image to practice with. So what I've done is uh, I've been on to a website which offers free imagery. So uh, this uh, this picture, which we provided on the pack and is also available to you if you want to just go and get it yourself. Um, it's available for, for personal and commercial use as long as it's attributed correctly. So here I am attributing it. This is from the free pick website as a uh, uh, free for commercial use picture. But crucially, as I said, it fulfills all the categories we need. It's a side profile against the plain background with no shadows on the face. So grab that. Uh, and uh, we're off, right? So I'm just going to create a, a blank file to get us started. Uh, um, we can just drag this image straight in to the software like so and get rid of that. And I'm just going to scale it up until it pretty much fills my space if I center it. OK, so first thing we want to do is find the boundary. Nothing magical here, nothing new here, just tracing tool. I set the colors to black and white and threshold it down so that, oops, sorry, up so that we find that face boundary like so. Uh, maximum filter, loose fit. I just want this to be very approximate. It's an artistic job at the end of the day. Apply that. Uh, get rid of all of the cruff in the middle. I think that's the technical term. So it comes in groups. So I'm going to ungroup it. Just select that lot. He said. Got to select for the right direction. Let's do this again. Let's close that out. So I'm going to select everything, get deselect that one so that I can delete what's remaining. So I held down the shift key uh, to deselect the main boundary. And now I'm now I have a boundary. Okay. New in version 10 was some uh, editing uh, for pictures. So you can adjust the contrast and the brightness in the software. Uh, and we can also use it crucially. I select this image and I select this new boundary, uh, we can crop the image to the boundary. So I'm going to do crop bitmap and that removes all of that outline area. Now I'm going to be using the bitmap quite a bit. So I'm going to just also another top tip when you're working on bitmaps, sometimes when you want to focus on that bitmap, you can temporarily change the fading to be a lot less faded um, when it's deselected. So it keeps, uh, keeps it a little bit more visible uh, when it's deselected. Okay, so uh, 
Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to offset in to get some form of the outline of his cheek. OK, and uh, depending on what size you're doing, uh, this distance is going to vary. But there's a rule that you can use every time that gets you whatever that distance should be, regardless of the scale you're working at. So I'm going to use the measure tool, not the dimensions, but the measure tool to measure just from the bridge of his nose to roughly where his eye socket is. So I'm trying to find this sort of socket edge. OK, and you can see up here, whoops, let me click, click that. Uh, you can see up here it's about 1.7. Hopefully you can see that 1.7 inches in this particular case. But whatever size you're working at, just find that crucial measure off the photograph that you're working at. And that is the value you want to put into the offsetting. So we take that. We're going to offset it inwards by 1.7. Offset that in. And that's going to give us the basic outline. You can see how it's picked up his cheek a little bit here. It's quite cool, isn't it? Uh, and then uh, what I want to do, though, is I want to move the back bit of this closer to the back of his head. So I'm going to go slip just into node editing mode and I can see straight away we've got a ton of uh, line segments. So generally speaking, it's nearly always really useful uh, when you're working with artwork to use the simplest artwork you can get away with. So the first thing I'm going to do is just reduce the number of points without dramatically affecting the shape. And that makes it easier to manipulate now in node editing mode. And I'm going to box select the nodes that form the back part of this. I don't want these ones, so I can also box select with a shift key pressed to deselect. And once I've grabbed that lot, I can just drag it as a, oh, not the not the one on its own, made a mess of that. Let's try that again. So we're going to group select the nodes, deselect these nodes, and then drag all of this lot close to the back of the head like so and then I'm going to do something similar here just to bring the neckline down a bit as well okay so what I've got now is a sort of inset but it's been made pretty much procedurally I haven't had to draw it uh, now I'm going to introduce the main part of this demo which is the new shape creation tools so up here you'll see in 10.5 for Aspire customers we have got new shapes we've got a um, a new uh, set of profiles here, uh, both a concave and a convex or smooth profile. And we've also got this opportunity here to, whoops, to blend to the inner vectors, which is the two I'm going to use in this case. So I'm going to select my two shapes, the inner and the outer. I'm going to use the smooth option. So we're going to blend smoothly out of one and into the other using the blend to inner shapes. I'm not worried at the moment about how tall it is. We'll sort that all out at the end. But we get a shape here, which is quite difficult to have produced in any other way. And you can see it's quite smooth, but it's already capturing a reasonable amount of face detail for us. I'm going to start a new component and select the original boundary and use our old shape creation system. So just a simple profile, no limit, 45 degree start. And I'm just going to apply uh, that as well. So that's going to produce another very conventional shape that hopefully you're all familiar with. And add it underneath. So we end up with two shapes. Uh, and they've got sort of different properties to them. So the, the basic puffy up shape has got a nice edge area, but it goes a bit wrong in terms of the interior shape of the face. And the other one has got a nice interior shape of the face. It's capturing the, the uh, the cheekbone and all that sort of stuff, but the edge is a bit weak. But the joy of our system is we can add the two together. So we can add the two together. And now we can just adjust their relative influence by adjusting their heights in the component property setting. So we can take down the rounded height a little bit and its contribution to the shape, like so. And we can take this down a little bit as well so that you get the balance between the two types of shape. OK, until you're getting something which you think captures the human face a little bit. It's the only bit of artistic -y work you need to do. The rest of it, pick those, smooth them. Oh, it asked me to bait them together, which I'm happy to do. So I get one component and smooth it. OK, take it all the way to the top. So that we're now getting a shape, you can see, which is amazingly capturing a lot of the, uh, the shape. But we've had to do virtually no artistic work at all. It's just the product of the two new blend blending uh, prop the shapes that we've got both blending between vectors and blending with smooth profile edges. Okay, so that's the, the basics. Now, the little bit of magic that we always throw in at the end is to go back to the bitmap um, 
and this is a, a technique again that uh, we'll we'll see time and time again. If I just go back to the bitmap, I uh, create a component from that. So if I have it selected, then it will create the component directly from the grayscale. So now I have a grayscale laid over the top. And again, we can take that grayscale and we'll just smooth it a little bit. So this time a lot less aggressively. And in fact, at this point, if you're really keen, you can get in and do some um, um, sculpting, but uh, I'm not good with the old sculpting tools. If I was Todd or Becky, that's probably what I'd do. But that's it, right? So even a numpty like me can make a really nice shape. Okay, so if you just follow those procedures, key is good photograph to start with. You can't use any photograph. You are going to have to create a photograph which has these properties. Uh, but it does open up potentially the possibility of a nice automated way of getting a, a not bad result uh, in a lot of cases. Notice it is a bit of an optical illusion. His eyebrow is actually recessed because it's dark. His hair is all a bit, you know, variable. But it's amazing how much you'll get away with it. As far as I can see, it works pretty, pretty well across a wide variety of skin tones. It kind of works a lot with different hair. Glasses are a problem, uh, but you can model those back in. Yeah, or, or ask your subject just for once to go a glass free. And um, so, yeah, just try it out, see how far you can get with the technique. It's quite a nice technique. Um, and uh, like I said, it uses these new uh, features in the shape editing. So the final thing I want to talk to you about in this demo is the laser module. OK, so uh, in order to, to do that, I'm just going to machine this uh, face. So we're just going to use the mat standard material uh, setup. Uh, and I'm just going to, yeah, don't care about the machine. I just want to machine the model. So I'm going to select the model boundary and I'm going to offset it out by half an inch. It's going to find the boundary, but machine beyond that by half an inch just to make life a little bit easier to see. Um, so I want to just show you, this is using a, an eighth ball nose, so uh, a relatively small tool, but, but, but plausible. Okay, and you can see the finish you can get. It's really quite nice, even in the machining. Uh, in fact, the machining tends to do effectively a smoothing pass, really. So um, it's it's pretty good. So we've gone from uh, from this to this part very quickly. But if you have the laser attached to your machine, uh, some of you will know that one of the key things about a laser is that we can actually uh, burn a picture. Right. And because the laser is attached to a 3D machine, we can also move the laser up in 3D to hold the focal point absolutely on the surface that we know we've now created that way up there. Uh, so we know what the surface looks like. So we can move the machine over the surface and keep it com constantly in registration. And that is really powerful. So I can carve this. And then with uh, the new laser module, I can also come back, take that original photograph uh, and we can carve over the surface. We can burn over the surface projecting onto the model as we go and calculate that. And you can see here, now we have a toolpath rastering over the surface. The blue to black is indicating the power of the laser as it goes, but the, also you can see it's a 3D toolpath. So it's maintaining a constant distance over the surface as well. So we'll hold the focal length. And now we can play that back as well. So if I just play uh, that one back, so you'll see there's a little laser head. Probably can't see that terribly well, but it's moving over the surface at the moment. And we'll actually start to mark the surface with the laser picture. Terrible moire effect, I'm afraid, on the display, but hopefully you can get the feel. So over the surface now, we've striped it back and forth and added the photograph back in. And I hope you can see this is a really, really amazing result that I don't think really you could do any other way, um, uh, either with a conventional laser, um, or indeed with a with a conventional CNC machine. It is a truly hybrid project that has a really pleasing outcome. Okay, so I think uh, that is, uh, that's it for the demos. Uh, if you've got questions and stuff, please do get involved, go online. We'll be around now uh, uh, dealing with those as they come up. If you've not had a little dabble in 10.5, please uh, go for it. Don't forget, there's loads more videos about the stuff that I've discussed uh, online in much more detail, but hopefully this was a, a good overview of the features of 10.5. And I'll see you next when I talk about uh, the photo V carving um, technique. Uh, so not just the strategy that we get in the software, but the technique itself and how we might use that to do some more interesting stuff with photographs. Uh, and that's tomorrow. So I look forward to seeing you then. Okay, thanks everyone.
and I will catch you all over the next couple of days on the uh, on the UGM site. Bye for now. Thank you.